Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to our cinema space. Those of you who have already been in the conference in our theatre, thanks for making it along. Uh, we just have a two-hour slot for this, so in the interest of time, I shall introduce quickly our next speaker. Um, it is Tony Prescott, thank you. <laughs> You've joined us from uh, Sheffield Robotics and we'll be meeting some robots today. After Tony's session, we're going to move straight into Eleanor Sighter as well, so we'll be here until four. I would quickly like to thank our respondents who will be kicking off our audience Q&A, so Boaz Levin and Vera Tolman. Um, and please join me in welcoming Tony, thank you. Good afternoon, um, and thank you very much for coming along. Uh, is, is that right volume for everyone? Good. So, uh, I'm a, an academic. I studied psychology as my first degree. Um, I grew up with a fascination for understanding the mind and human behavior, and how to explain and understand it. And uh, I have, for the last 25 years, been trying to do that by building and using robots to try and understand what we are. So I'm a psychologist, but I describe myself as a synthetic psychology, somebody who synthesizes things, uh, who makes things. So most psychologists analyze human behavior. I try and synthesize it in a robot. And I hope to give you a flavor of that today. And uh, we will also show you some robots. Um, they say don't perform with children and animals, don't perform with robots either. Uh, they are uh, often unreliable, and we'll see how that goes. So these are, this is one of the robots I've built. So I, we started off building uh, animal-like robots. Uh, on the left-hand side there you see a pet rat. I hope nobody's phobic about rats. And uh, that's running around. It's actually uh, uh, on my windowsill in Sheffield on a rare sunny day. And you can see that the rat explores with his whiskers, and he moves his whiskers back and forth. Uh, many times in each second. And to the rat, his whiskers are uh, what our fingertips are to us. They're the way to interrogate the world and understand it through the sense of touch. And in the bottom right, what you see is one of our whiskered robots. This was one called Shrewbot. And uh, he has artificial whiskers. You can see the, those things, and they're moving there slightly slower than the rat's whiskers. Uh, and this robot has no other senses on it. It just explores and understands the world through touch. And there you can see interacting with um, Martin's hand. So uh, we wanted to understand sensory systems. Uh, we wanted to understand, first of all, uh, the rat. And we started by looking at the rat brain. And these different areas of the rat brain, actually, models of those are incorporated into the control system for our robot. So to show you another one of our whiskered robots. So this is actually Ben Mitchinson on the right, who programmed and built uh, this uh, newer version of the whiskered robot. And uh, without warning me that he was going to do this, one day he decided to put his face in the way of the robot. And this is actually a very powerful robot arm, so he was taking a bit of a risk. Um, but you can see that using the brain-like or brain-based control systems, the sense of touch that the robot has is really quite gentle. And it's attending to different parts of Ben's face, uh, detecting it with its whiskers. Uh, if, if you know somebody who is uh, blind, then they might greet you and recognize you by touching your face. And we can do something similar with these whisker sensors. We can detect and discriminate surfaces and shapes in the same way that animals do. So uh, we're now moving from uh, the rat-based uh, robot to uh, what I think is going to be one of the first commercial robot companions. It's a robot called Miro that I've been developing with the designer Sebastian Conrad, who's designed the appearance, and the publisher Eagle Moss Publishing. And uh, we're taking uh, all the things we've learned uh, from uh, building rat-like robots and, and building this sort of uh, mammal-like robot. And I just wanted to show you uh, it's really a trailer for the robot. Um, after the trailer, or you might say it's even an advert, because hopefully it will be available in the shops later this year, um, we're going to go into a short play uh, about companion robots. So um, let me show you this. What is it that connects us? We learn as we live. 
we get happy. We get sad. When we're tired, we recharge our batteries. Now there's an artificially intelligent robot that you can build, program, and connect with. Nero, developed by leading robotic scientists. Learn about the world of robotics and connect with Miro, your unique biomimetic robot. Build Miro every week. Part one out now. So, uh, for anyone that's, you know, 14 year old or older, then you'll be able to buy and build this hopefully later this year, early next year. So, um, and we brought some of our robots along to show you, and we thought that uh, one way to do this was to create a short drama in which the robots are the actors. Um, so, I, I don't know how this will go because you haven't had much time to rehearse, uh, but uh, robots, when they do work, are pretty predictable. Um, so the theme here is companion robots. Could we have companion robots? And uh, after our short play, uh, we'll talk about uh, the concept of companion robots and also the difference between uh, robots and, and people. So, uh, and... I'll just set the mood music going. Whoops. This is Kevin, the robot seal. Kevin, hello. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you some more about uh, the robot seal in a bit, but uh, uh, I think it, we're going to have a human intervention now. Ah.
So I really wanted to show you uh, some of our robots today. So uh, fortunately they worked and you can see that uh, the state of the art is we have robots that can move and uh, one of the distinctive things about Zeno is that he has a face. I hope you can see it uh, probably easier from the front that moves and can make expression, emotional expressions uh, that are recognizable to people. So he can show anger and happiness, uh, sadness and so on in a recognizable way. And we're using this robot uh, in schools right now to see if we can uh, help teach children about healthy living uh, using the robot as an, as an example or as a teaching assistant. Uh, the robot seal that you saw uh, before, um, which is perfectly healthy, I should say, there's no harm has come to the seal in the making of this play. Um, that is designed in, in Japan as a companion for uh, older people particularly and people with Alzheimer's disease. And we've been testing it in Sheffield to see how useful it can be. And the idea with, with the para-robot seal is that it can help people with Alzheimer's come out of their shell and interact more with uh, other people, uh, and also, of course, interact with the robot. And if you're visiting your relative who's perhaps in a home and you don't have much to talk about, well, the seal gives a kind of social bridge, something uh, that you can have a shared conversation about. So uh, these robots are, are proving useful as um, ways to improve communication, if you like, uh, uh, in old people. Uh, when people think about robot companions, I, I think a lot of people worry that they replace human companions. But I, I strongly think that robot relationships aren't going to be like human-human relationships. Though they may have some similarities, but they'll also have differences. Um, there was a wonderful story in the New York Times at the end of last year about a, a mother who described how her son, who was 13 and had autism, uh, had uh, struck up a friendship with Siri, the uh, automatic uh, language understanding program on many iPhones. And 
Gus, uh, who was the boy, uh, loves theory because it could answer questions for him that his mother couldn't answer. So one of the questions he had for his mum uh, one day was, you know, Mum, what aeroplanes are flying overhead us right now? And of course she didn't have a clue, but he could ask that question to Siri, and remarkably enough, uh, Siri could access the schedules of all the airline companies, and uh, knowing his geographical location, it could tell him what aeroplanes were in the area and could be flying over. So. Um, Gus had a really good relationship with Siri, and his mother, Judith, in this article, she said one of the good things was that uh, Gus's speech wasn't fantastic. He, he talked like he had a mouthful of marbles. But to be understood by Siri, uh, Siri does speech recognition, but it's not as good as human speech recognition. He had to enunciate clearly. So uh, as well as answering his questions, it also helped him uh, to speak more clearly. So uh, there's a lot of research now looking at the possibility of using robots with autistic children because uh, children with autism are drawn to the predictability and reliability of robots and uh, as a way of helping them to gain uh, social skills that will then help them to build uh, relationships with other people. And a, a final example, this is uh, an MIT robot uh, called Huggable and it's being tried out in hospitals. And uh, as you can see, it's very tactile, uh, it's cuddly, uh, it, it can talk in an annoying American accent, I'm not going to play that. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that they're finding with it is that uh, children will uh, engage with the robot differently to the way how they'll engage with uh, people. And in particular, if, if uh, the child's having difficulty talking about how their feelings about the illness, they may say something to the robot that they might not say to an adult. So there are these different ways in which we might imagine having relationships with robots. And maybe we, when we come to the question and answers, we could uh, talk about what kind of relationships you'd like to have with robots and whether relationships with robots are a good idea. So uh, I want to go to a broader question now, um, which really is, is the thing that occupies me in my research. So, when I tell people that I'm trying to build uh, robots that have some of the qualities and behaviors of animals and humans, then people often say, well, of course, that's not going to work because you're not going to be able to capture everything that a human is in a robot. And then I ask them, say, well, what do you mean? What, what aspects of uh, being human do you think I won't be able to capture? And uh, in my teaching, I've started to do a questionnaire with the level one students, the psychology students who have done, done, done A-level psychology, but it's the first time they've been exposed to this idea of building robots. And I asked them what would be the hard thing, hardest thing to build into a robot if you wanted to make a synthetic human. And uh, this, these are some of the things that they think are difficult and, and easy. And if you look at this graph, what you see is that um, the business of moving and sensing the world like we do isn't too hard. So zero here is easy and five is very hard. So sensory and motor stuff, they don't think is very hard. Actually, as a roboticist, it is very hard to get a robot to move and to sense the world like le we do. We take it for granted, our ability to do that. Perhaps a third of your brain at the back is just doing vision processing alone. That's really what our brains have evolved to do, this sensory and motor control. So people tend to think reasoning is quite hard. That's up 3.5. Um, Common sense is harder still, and I think they're right there, and that's one of the uh, places where uh, AI and robotics right now has a, is a bit stuck. Our common sense, everyday understanding of the world is really hard to capture in synthetic things. Uh, learning, maybe not too difficult. Language, actually, people think isn't that hard, but I think they're, they're deceived by the fact that we can do speech recognition in robots and AIs, but language understanding is still very tricky. And then every year, everyone always says emotions. Emotions are really hard to do in a robot. Well, we can do emotional expression in Xeno, but that's not the same as emotion, of course. Can the robot feel emotion? Well, I don't think Xeno does. I don't think Paro does. Certainly, I don't think uh, we pained him when we pretended to beat him to death just now. Um, but we can uh, project, perhaps, our own emotions onto robots. Uh, 
we're not really sure what, what emotions are, but um, the psychological understanding of emotions that I have suggests maybe it's not going to be that difficult to create robots that have uh, a, a, a feelings that may be something akin to the ones we have. Whether we want to do that, though, is another question. And then the thing that's always hardest to reproduce, uh, sometimes I put it down as consciousness in these questionnaires, and more recently I've been calling it a sense of self. People always think it's going to be difficult to create a robot with a sense of self. So that's what I want to talk about now. Could we create a robot with a sense of self? But before we can address that, we really have to say, well, what is the self that we might want to create in a robot? And uh, one place to start, of course, is with philosophy. And uh, one of our most famous European philosophers, René Descartes, and perhaps the most famous expression in philosophy, I think, therefore I am. And uh, what Descartes was really saying was, I think, and I know that thinking things must exist, and therefore I am. So the very fact that I'm thinking proves that I exist. And in a way, what he was saying was that the self is primary. I can't analyze it. I can't decompose it any further. I just know that I'm there. So for Descartes, the self was a given. It was an essential thing. But uh, 100 years later, uh, a British philosopher, David Hume, had almost the exact opposite view. David Hume said there wasn't a self. And what he said was that uh, when I think about what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I never can catch myself at any time without a perception and can never observe anything but the perception. So what was his self was just the fleeting passage of different experiences. And he went on to say, if anyone upon serious and unprejudiced reflection thinks he has a different notion of himself, I must confess I can no longer reason with him. He may perhaps perceive something simple and continued, that's like Descartes' idea of an essential self, which he calls himself, though I'm certain there is no such principle in me. So Hume, one of our uh, leading lights of uh, the British world of philosophy, said there really was no self when he looked for it. He could not see it. And this idea that the self might be an illusion, of course, is shared by uh, religions, particularly Buddhism. And in Buddhism, there is the idea that the illusion of self, what they call anatta, is actually one of the things that makes us unhappy. This idea that we ourselves uh, is actually one of the things that leads to our unhappiness. If we could be freed of it, uh, perhaps we'd, we'd lead uh, better, more fulfilling and happier lives. So again, something we can talk about. So uh, I wrote an article for New Scientist talking about what the self really was, because I wasn't entirely happy with the self being an illusion, because there is something that my self is, and I'm finding it very hard to dispel it, uh, meditation or whatever. And I came up with the idea that the self is a process. Of course, it's not a new idea. Other people have suggested this as well. But the, the point here is that it's a process rather than an essence. It's not a thing like an essence which is there all the time. It is something which comes into being in your brain. And when people talk about uh, processes in the context of computers, they're thinking about a computer running a program. While it's running the program, there's a process going on. While Zeno is running his program, there's a process happening. And when now he's switched off, the process has gone. And in the same way, I think that when you are conscious and awake and listening to this talk, there's a process running in your mind and your brain, the process is your mind, and we can think of it in some ways analogously to what's happening inside the robot. Now, if you accept this, and you may want to argue with it that we're not processes, then we, I'll go a bit further and perhaps try and convince you that this idea of the self as being process, or in fact a set of processes, might be useful. It might help us get some uh, understanding, perhaps, of what we are and what it would mean to build a robot a bit like ourselves. So uh, as a psychologist, I'm interested in the different aspects of, of what we're calling the self. And here are some of the things that we mean when we're talking about uh, having a self. Uh, we have a point of view. So there's somewhere that you see the world from. And it's a point somewhere in the middle of your head, usually. And you look out on the world. And when you wake up in the morning, 
you remember where you were and you suddenly you're seeing the world from the same perspective. You have a feeling of body ownership, so you know what's your body and what's not your body. Uh, and that seems very instinctive, that you can tell what's you and what's not you. It's not trivial to program in a robot, but it's possible. And in the same way, you distinguish yourself from others, and that's one of the most primitive aspects of self, perhaps, that uh, all animals maybe share. Then you recognize yourself. Uh, if you look in a mirror and you see that you've got a mark on your face, uh, you know to perhaps uh, wipe your face and try and move the mark. And when we do tests with other animals, there's very few animals, perhaps elephants and chimpanzees, that seem to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror. And that's evidence, perhaps, that not all animals have this kind of a self, the ability to see themselves, perhaps, from another perspective. And we also, as humans, can see others as being what I call agents, sort of uh, things that that happen and, and, and can act in the world and perhaps are like you. So we, we look around and we see other people also as selves. You have an idea of who you are and that builds up into your life story and you have a life story you can tell to other people and you identify yourself with that life story and you have goals that you care about and that you try and do things to advance those goals. And you have a stream of consciousness, whatever that is. And uh, I'm going to try and avoid getting into that today, but uh, to some extent I think the stream of consciousness is what happens when all these other things are working and going on inside your brain. The psychologist Ulrich Neisser kind of talked about these different aspects of the self and he split them up into five categories. One was a physical self, so having a point of view a uh, feeling of owning your body, uh, perhaps distinguishing yourself from others, that was your physical self. And then there's the interpersonal self, that you can see yourself, recognize self in a mirror, that you can see other people as agents. Then the temporal self is the idea that you had a past and also that you have a future ahead of you, your ability to think backwards in time and project yourself forwards in time. Again, that's not something that other animals seem to do uh, in the way that we do. And then the conceptual self is your life story and your personal goals and your stream of consciousness, perhaps your private self. The psychologist William James, going back to uh, the end of the 19th century, suggested there was a me, there was the thing that all these different aspects of you, the content of yourself, things like your life story, and then there was the I, the thing that experienced it all, the stream of consciousness, if you like. So these two aspects of self, but we can maybe break them down into many different aspects of self. And the self, of course, develops. We're not uh, born with a complete self, and uh, we can uh, look at very young children and infants, newborn infants, and we can do tests to see what kind of sense of self uh, they have when they're born. Of course, they can't talk to us about their selves, but there are other ways of Psychologists have discovered clever ways of, of eliciting information, even from newborn babies, about maybe what they are able to think about. And what we know is that they have a point of view, uh, that they can distinguish themselves from others. Probably even inside the womb, you're learning by touching your body inside the womb as a fetus, and touching perhaps the womb, uh, and, and recognizing a different kind of signal through your touch, sense of touch. And that's one of the ways that we develop this sense of what's you and what's not you. Um, we have no idea if they have a stream of consciousness, but almost certainly uh, babies don't have much awareness of their personal past and future. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why it's so difficult to remember anything that happened to you before you were three or four year old. We also know that self-recognition in a mirror is something that happens slightly later when children are around three or four. And they, they achieve something called theory of mind when they're around four years old, which is the ability to understand that other people have a different perspective on the world than you have. Now, if you're a parent and you've, you, you've brought up children, you might have noticed that up to about the age of three or four, they're very egocentric. The world revolves around them, and they uh, think that you're just there to make sure they're happy and everything is going straight. And when they get to four, they achieve a kind of breakthrough, which is a bit of a relief as a parent. <laughs> Suddenly they're aware that there are other things happening in your life and that you, they're not the only thing that matters. So this theory of mind, this uh, 
sense of, of others as being agents and actors with their own goals is something that we don't achieve straight away when we're born. So when I say that the self is a process, people think, well, why? Well, if it's a process, why didn't I realize that before? Why isn't it obvious to me that it, it's a process going on in my brain? Um, and uh, I, I think this, that's a difficult question, but there are lots of things we don't understand about ourselves and that we're only beginning to understand through science. And perhaps it's one of the reasons why uh, Buddhists meditate for so long on these kinds of questions, is that these things are not obvious. They're part of our culture, and we've grown up with them. Uh, but we have to take a, st a step away and look objectively at ourselves in order to understand what we are. So perhaps the, the, the self process, because we're in it, because it is us, and we're looking out through it, it acts as a kind of window, and the process itself seems transparent. We can't reflect back on it. So that's one reason why it's maybe hard to get intuitions about it and to see it for what it is uh, objectively. Now, of course, one popular idea is that yourself can, is not bound to your physical body, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a religious idea, although obviously the idea of having a soul that can migrate perhaps to a, uh, another dimension or to another body uh, has its roots in this. But there are modern versions of this idea of being able to go outside of your body, and I want to talk about one of those now. So. Uh, there's an experiment uh, that's been called the rubber hand illusion, uh, which shows that your sense of yourself and, and how your body is configured is actually very flexible. Now, in this experiment, what happens, and there's a video here that illustrates this, is that you put your own hand behind a screen where you can't see it, and a lifelike rubber hand is placed in front of you on the table. So you're looking at the rubber hand. Uh, but uh, the experimenter is then stroking your hand with a paintbrush and exactly the same way stroking the rubber hand. So you feel the sensation of a stroking on the back of your hand, but you see it happening to the rubber hand. Now the remarkable thing is that for many people within a minute or two, they start to experience the rubber hand as part of their body. Even up to the point in some of the experiments, somebody will come along with a hammer and they'll bash the rubber hand and people jump out of their seats because uh, of course they think they've been hit on the hand but they haven't. So uh, I don't do that experiment, it's far too mean. But uh, it demonstrates that your sense of your own body is very flexible and of course it needs to be because your body changes as you grow and we have this remarkable ability uh, that we can take a tool like a rake for instance and more or less incorporate it into your body. We do the same thing when we drive a car, the car becomes part of our self, and our physical self almost extends to include the, the, the perimeter of the car. Now, that's one way in which our physical self is really flexible. Uh, here's another way. Uh, you may have seen the film Avatar, so just if you haven't, here's the trailer, uh, just to remind you about that. The concept is to drive these remotely controlled bodies called avatars. They're grown from human DNA mixed with DNA of the natives. Green in an avatar body. That's a potent mix. You get me what I need, I'll see to it you get your legs, babe. Your real legs. Hell yes, sir. Looks like you. This is your avatar. Just relax and let your mind go blank. It shouldn't be hard for you. The idea of Avatar is that uh, a marine who's lost the use of his legs through this uh, immersive sort of virtual reality system, uh, which is able to read his mind, projects his mind into uh, a, a genetically grown uh, alien body, and then he runs around on this planet uh, and makes friends with all the natives. So of course, that might seem very far-fetched, but it's not really that far away. And what we had hoped to show you was uh, the ability to project yourself into a robot body. We have a robot in Sheffield, and we have a telepresence system that allows you to pr project into it. Now we're having connectivity problems, so we can't quite show you that demo, but I'll show you a video of uh, another experiment that's been carried out in, in, in Europe. This was from the, the, the VER project. I hope it's going to work.
So uh, it, it's the same idea as Avatar. So what you have is a, a man uh, with uh, sensors on his skull which are actually reading brain activity. So it's detecting electrical currents which are generated by thinking, this chap here. And he's seeing uh, what's visible from the humanoid robot vision system. And then he's using his thoughts to control the movement of the robot. So you can see he's pushing this Coke can uh, using the robot body, um, but projecting his thoughts into the robot body, which I think is pretty impressive and not far off what they're doing in Avatar minus the you know, sort of genetic, genetically built alien body. That's a bit, of, bit more tricky. And what we can do right now in Sheffield is we can, on a good day, remotely control our robot uh, from anywhere in the country, perhaps worldwide. So using a virtual reality system, you can project yourself into the robot in Sheffield. I hope we can link via Skype and just show you the robot anyway in a moment. So one of the things about having uh, a body is that uh, you learn the uh, configuration of your body. And this is just a, a, a nice illustration from Cornell University of a robot. This is the robot here. It's kind of a starfish shape. And it doesn't know its body, but it has a learning program. And it explores by moving its various limbs and parts. And it discovers that it has four legs, and each leg has a joint in the middle. It does that just by moving. And we do something very similar. It's called motor babbling. And uh, as an infant, as a fetus, you move around in the, in the womb. And one of the things we think that's happening when you're moving in the womb is that you're starting to learn about your body. So you're, you're not. Uh, it's not innate, the ability to sense the body. We have a very plastic uh, process which learns about the body, the different parts of the body, and is therefore able to modify its self-model as you grow. And using uh, the self-model that this robot learned, it was actually able, able to figure out how to, to walk in a rather clumsy way, admittedly, but it could move along, and it could... There, there's the real robot with this program. It, 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 developed its own sense of its body, and then it, it learned how to use that body in order to move. And it takes about a year for us to be able to stand up and, and walk around. And for much of that year, as an infant, you were probably learning about your body and the things that you could do with it, and figuring out how to stand on two legs and so on. So not too different from what this robot's now trying to do. So I, I, I said that the self has developed and uh, in every one of us when we're born we develop these self processes over time and of course the self has also evolved so uh, other mammals when we look at them have a different <coughs> sense of self I would say that most animals have some feeling of, of what they are but uh, for instance the social self the ability to see the world from another p person's point of view is something that may even be uniquely human or certainly a few animals may have it but uh, we have it to uh, a really strong ex extent because we're very social animals. And I think also to some extent language helps us to get this. And so our capacity for empathy is, is perhaps one of the things that distinguishes us because we can think about what it must be like for another person and we can uh, empathetically think about the happiness or the pain that those, that person might be experiencing. And that, that's why I quite like this cartoon. And the reason that this is funny, the old lady is explaining to the cat how would you like it if the mouse did that to you? And the reason this is funny is because we don't think cats have a great deal of empathy. So the, the cat is not going to understand uh, how bad it was for the mouse, whereas perhaps you can project yourself into the mouse and see how uh, unlucky it was. I, I'm working right now on this idea of the temporal self, the, the, the self in the past and in the future. Uh, your autobiographical memory helps you to remember the things that happened in your life. And to a large extent, those define what you are. The past episodes taken together build up the narrative, which is the story you tell to yourself and to other people about who and what you are. And if you lost that, that would make a huge difference to who you are. And it turns out that the parts of the brain that underpin the narrative self, uh, if you lose those, you also lose the ability to think about yourself into the future. So you can no longer even conceive that you might have a future and what that would be like. Uh, there's a famous uh, patient called NN, 
and the psychologist Envolt Tolbing studied him in the 80s. And uh, he had damage to this part of the brain. He couldn't remember anything in his past. He couldn't think what the future was like. This was the conversation where Tolbing asked him, what will you be doing tomorrow? And he just says, I don't know. I don't have any idea. Uh, and then he said, do you remember the question about what I'll be doing tomorrow? So he remembers the question. He can process the question. He has a sort of self going on, but it's a self that's in the present all the time. How would you describe your state of mind when you try to think about it? And after a pause, it's sort of blank, I guess. And then after a while, he says, it's like swimming in the middle of a lake. There's nothing there to, to hold you up or to do anything with. So it's a kind of frightening idea of if you lost your past and you didn't, couldn't think about your future, then just to try and imagine it is like floating in some vast lake. There's nothing you can do. You're kind of marooned in the present. And I know that we're sometimes advised to live more in the present, but the possibility of being marooned in the present is really quite scary. And that's why I'd like to develop and understand how we can create an autobiographical memory uh, for our robot. So I want to leave you uh, with three questions, and then I'll show a video. And um, we maybe <coughs> try and quickly Skype to our robot in Sheffield. Um, would it be useful to have a robot with a sense of self? Well, I think. Uh, it would actually. I think a, a robot with a physical sense of self would be much safer around people because if it knew where, where its body was, if it knew what was it and what was not it, it would be a safer robot. If it, was, if it had a social self, an interpersonal self, then it would be able to better understand who you were and the kinds of things you liked and wanted. Uh, so it would be able to, uh, perhaps empathy is too strong a word, but it would be able to understand your needs and be able to make sense of them better and, and help you with them. And then uh, to have a temporal self, to have an, uh, a, a knowledge of its own past and future, would of course uh, allow it to personalize the help it's giving uh, and anticipate the kinds of things you like and are, are likely to want to do in the future. So having a temporal self, a social self, and a physical self, I think are all things which would be useful to have in these companion robots. And people worry, uh, does thinking about this, this idea of the self as a set of processes, does it make us less human in some way? Um, and we can talk about this. It's a, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is, th is to dispel the idea that thinking about the self as a process doesn't mean that everything that we think of as thoughts and feelings and beliefs and motives, all these ideas that come from our everyday sense of minds, a sort of, if, if you like, sort of uh, folk psychology. Those ideas don't need to be thrown away. We can still think about ourselves in those terms. I'm not saying that uh, the brain, that the mind reduces to the brain and we just talk about neural firings. I think we can understand what thoughts and beliefs and feelings are uh, at this higher level and more scientifically, but we don't get rid of those concepts. On the other hand, I think actually what this new scientific way of understanding what ourselves is could, could, in the Buddhist tradition, a sort of Western version of the Buddhist tradition, help us understand ourselves better, uh, maybe even be more at ease with who we are. And then finally, uh, could a robot be a person? Now, if you look back in philosophy, then uh, there's various suggestions of what it means to be a person. Uh, John Locke in the 17th century and Daniel Dennett, uh, one of the most famous living philosophers, have both written about this. Uh, Locke said a person uh, can reason and has language. Uh, they have mental states such as beliefs, desires, and intentions. They can have relationships. They should be morally responsible for its actions. Uh, all of these things, I think, uh, we could someday have a robot do these things. We maybe can't do them now, but in the future we could. Uh, neither Locke nor Dennett said you had to be made of biological tissue to be a person. Perhaps it wasn't such an issue for Locke, but Daniel Dennett certainly doesn't think that uh, it, it, it's critical that you're a biological entity in order to be a person. And Dennett actually says what's maybe more important is that you're treated as a person by others. And I think that's what is likely to happen with robots is because we tend to project anyway onto machines, particularly ones that are at all lifelike, the idea that there's an entity inside which is making decisions. I think we will do that more and more for robots, and we will come to treat them more and more, perhaps not as persons, 
but as things in themselves and we'll be able to have relationships with them and we might think of them and become fond of them and in the way that the Japanese have become fond of their Ivo robots. And it's perhaps not that strange an idea to mourn the loss of your Ivo robot, because really it's just you know, uh, getting closure for yourself and saying goodbye to something that's been an important part of your life. And I think in the future we might feel that about robots. So, yeah, before we do that, I'm going to see if we can Skype uh, to Sheffield. You know what's there? <laughs> Hello, I come. <laughs> so this is Uriel. Um, the plan was originally that we would demonstrate telepresence into the iCub robot. That's not working, but, but maybe iCub will be able to move. Hello? Oh, here he goes. Hello, London. I'm the iCub from Chevy Robotics. Believe it or not. Today we have a sunny day in Sheffield. <laughs> so anyway, that's ICUP. So unfortunately we couldn't do telepresence, but uh, perhaps we can come back another time and show you that, uh, our version of Avatar. <laughs> So I think that that's pretty much all we've got time for. So um, I just want to thank, uh, there's lots of people to thank, so I just want to particularly credit Ben Mitchinson, who did a lot of the work on the Whiskered robots and who's working on the Miro robot. Uh, Emily Collins, who's been helping here today and is working with me on the possibility of human-robot relationships. And Matt also, who was helping with uh, the, our, our drama today. Sebastian Conran I'm working with uh, on several of these robot projects and uh, we've done a lot of this as part of European projects um, and with partners in Barcelona and Italy and elsewhere and so I want to just thank all the various people who have supported this and the Arts and Humanities Research Council is also supporting us right now to look at how this ability to project ourselves into robot bodies might change how we think of what we are. Thank you very much. Are you ready to take some questions? Yes, I'm very happy okay, to take questions. Okay, perfect. I think we have a response. <coughs> Um, first of all, thanks for the fascinating and very entertaining presentation. Um, I think, first of all, I mean, just aesthetically, one thing that came to mind for me was uh, this: the how your presentation or the show itself kind of harked back to this mechanical Turk, the robot and the fur, uh, you know, coming along and and showing this invisible uh, mechanism. To, to a crowd of uh, spectators, which I thought was interesting in, in, in this context. Um, maybe just to start from the end, I thought the, the definition you picked of a person was interesting um, by Locke and Dennett, um, since it's also, it kind of harks back to this uh, Scottish Enlightenment, uh, for the fathers of, uh, of, of modern day uh, liberal political economy in the sense that um, you, uh, the, the definition frames a, a person as a, as a rational, autonomous being, etc. Whereas, um, and these are, these are, let's say, very strong categories imbued in our understanding of economic transaction and uh, the economic realm as one which is um, governed by rational decisions, which some would say is not the case. <laughs> and this brings me to the question of 
the depiction of a human, um, as of a person as, as someone who is rational, also goes back to the, the description you gave of a process, the self as a process and the process as a, basically a program. And the program, um, and here maybe just to uh, kind of touch upon the, the direction of my question, is um, isn't the program, isn't the difference between a program and the self uh, based upon the binary limits of a program that is either or um, the type of uh, the, the fact that the program has a difficult time to uh, manage contradictory feelings, irrationality, uh, fuzziness, fuzzy logic, so to speak, whereas uh, human beings um, are governed by very fuzzy um, rationales. <laughs> So that, thanks for the question. So I think um, to go, go to the final point, uh, when I, I say that it's a process, I think we are m misled when we think about computer programs too much. And of course, that's where AI uh, took us initially in the 1950s. People were very excited about the idea that computer programs would be able to copy what people do in a very direct way. and. Uh, that enthusiasm lasted about 20 years and it didn't really happen. And then there was enthusiasm for something called neural networks, which was to go more directly to the brain and to try and copy the wiring of the brain, the, the fact that you have lots of simple processes all interacting together. And you have multiple simultaneous processes, not just one process. And there's a thing called fuzzy logic at the same time. And when you have neural networks and you, you have these other fuzzy systems, you can get the kind of irrational, contradictory stuff that humans have uh, in robots. So robots, by no means, have to behave rationally. They behave as uh, they often behave as irrationally as people that program them. But uh, I think when they're controlled by neural networks, and, and of course we have things that learn as well, and they, it's possible to learn contradictory things and to maintain contradictory ideas most of the time. So I guess what I'm I'm going for a materialist position but it's not process equals program. Perhaps I made that, uh, I, I equate those things too strongly. Process is, is something that's happening in your brain and the process is your mind. And uh, the mind is in that sense a virtual machine. But it is, the brain is a very different kind of processor than uh, any one of our computers we have today. And it will be decades before we have processors that are anything like as powerful as our brains. Yes? Um, hi. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the point about um, the, the person who lost um, all of their past memory and was unable to form future memory sort of seems to point at the fact that um, to be able to make future-based decisions, you need a data set on which to base that, um, which is quite interesting. Um, taking that into the, the context of the, um, um, the robots that were sort of um, getting to a version of or, or, or different consciousness or perceptions of the self through learning. So for example, the robot that was learning about its physicality and how to actually move. Um, and then if you look at all the various different attributes that you spoke about uh, um, that make up a, a human self, um, it, it, it would seem apparent that in effect for, the, for a robot to have a self or for its AI or its thinking to have a self, it would need to learn a lot of these processes and build up a data set which is its past which allows it to operate in its future. The big question is in terms of the way you design um, such robots, in terms of choices you make around what learning algorithms and what portions of humanity you choose to program into that, you will therefore get an output. So for example, if we decided not to have learning processes in robots around things like jealousy, hate, etc., you may have more benevolent outcomes, but we, we actually then tinkering. We don't know what the outcomes are going to be. So it, the question is just maybe discuss a little bit about these different processes that, that would be happening in terms of learning and how you think developing them in, in some sort of structure or framework has an impact on the end learnt AI or independent robot. So I, I, that, that's a really good question. So there's a couple of things. One is 
Uh, one of the really fascinating things I find about uh, NN was that the rest of his self or his other self processes are kind of intact. So that, that shows you that there isn't just one self process. So he was still, had a feeling of himself and of his life. He just couldn't remember yesterday or think about the future. And, and that, that gives me a view, I think like you're saying, there are different self processes we can build and others that we can choose not to build. So we could choose not to build things that lead to jealousy or greed and all these other things. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not too worried that we're going to build robots that will take over the world because we won't build robots with ambition. You know, I, I, I think um, ambition and that desire to survive and things is something that we have as evolved things. And that when we build robots, we will, we will be able to give them self-processes, but also be able to give them insight into their own self-processes. We don't have insight into our self-processes, but we'll be able to uh, program the robot so that it knows that, that what it is is a set of processes. And I think, in a way, that will make it uh, easier for the robot to know what it is. You know, if, once we understand ourselves better, we'll also our lives, I think, will be easier as a consequence. And that's, I think, one of the goals of, of my science. And I think that learning is a crucial part of it. And of course, learning is a big unknown too, because when we build some powerful learning algorithms, we're not necessarily sure what's going to happen with them. But I think we can do it in a constrained way. So we can, for instance, learn about past events in a way that can help us plan for the future. And that's the, the thing that I'm wanting to focus on for now, to give the robots this ability to use their past to understand what's going to happen next. And of course, that's what our memories are actually for. Uh, we find it very difficult to really recreate events from the past. What we do is it, we seed our, our minds with a few key ideas, and then we run a model of what might have happened. And that's why eyewitness testimony is often so unreliable, because people fill in things that never happened, but things that you might expect to happen. So our, our memories are actually, uh, our, our autobiographical memories, actually a device for predicting the future and planning the future, not so much for retrieving and recalling the past. Um, I mean, you're, you're, I very much enjoyed your presentation and you're very optimistic about the sort of possibilities, but I just wanted to put to you a more um, cynical version and I just wondered how you, how you would respond to it. I mean, you're well aware that a lot of the history of artificial intelligence was funded by the military, has got military purposes. And there is quite a discussion going on now about um, drone killings and how difficult it is to take drones to The Hague for war crimes because actually it's very difficult to attribute intentionality to distributed killing of that sort, yeah? And I just, I just wondered, A, how you feel, you know, what are the sort of motives do you think? Um, I mean, I'm not at all questioning your motives, but generally in terms of the sort of history of robotics, how you really think, um, the military aren't going to be using sophisticated robots and whether there's any sort of discussion kind of about that, but also the limits of the human that you're talking about in terms of things like motivation and intentionality, because it's a very serious discussion about war crimes at the moment and what they're, you know, how there's, there's you know, quite progressive campaigns, as you know, by some leading computer scientists yeah. in Britain are, uh, are engaged in those debates. So, yeah, there's a the campaign against killer robots, which is, uh, been in, in part initiated by Noel Sharkey, who's a colleague from Sheffield, and uh, I, I personally really support that. And the goal of that campaign is to say, let's not have robots make life and death decisions. So maybe we use robots in the theatre of war, but let's not let them make a decision as to whether to fire the weapon or not. Let's keep a human in the loop. And I, I believe that that's a big risk. Uh, and. There are lots of other ethical issues around the development of robots, um, uh, and certainly we could we could talk about them. But uh, it, it, I see it as we, we've got to balance benefit against risks. Um, so there are definitely lots of very positive things we can do with robots in the future, and I wouldn't like us to give up those uh, because we're worried about the risks. I'd like us to take actions like uh, maybe a United Nations. Uh, treaty that we won't have robots that can make life and death decisions. There is progress towards that. And I think we will have to think about other aspects of robots in the future too, and decide whether those are things that AI should do or AI should not do. Um, so perhaps this is just the first of several.
decisions we shall have to make. Uh, but I think it's also a very exciting time. You know, we used to think that uh, one day we'd be able to go off planet and meet alien intelligences, or that perhaps they would come and visit us. Uh, and then physics has, has shown us that there's no other life or no other intelligent life in our solar system. And that there's probably no other intelligent life for uh, millions of light years away from us. So, and that makes us kind of think, well, wouldn't it be interesting to have another intelligence that we could interact with? And actually, we have the ability with AI and robotics to create new kinds of, I'm not sure you call them life forms, but new kind of thinking entities that I think we could actually learn from and that we could benefit being around them. You know, I think we wiped out the last other uh, humanoid uh, a few million years ago, and it would have been nice if they had been around perhaps to interact with now. Uh, but with, by building robots, I think we can help understand ourselves better, and we can also perhaps create some other intelligent beings that can help us. Yes? Um, okay. Hello. Um, thank you for your thank you for your intervention. Um, I would like to grab the final part or the final question that you left us with, um, to then go back to the to the beginning of your presentation. And so, revisiting your interrogation of um, could the robot be a person, um, or could it become a person following the processual definition of the self that you presented, um, to ask if, um, could a robot be or become um, an animal? Because if not all animals are persons, surely all persons are animals. Okay. And from there, as I was saying, jump to the, to the beginning, which I was quite um, surprised or I was quite perplexed by um, noticing that the robots that you presented us, and, and generally robots, tend to resemble either persons or animals. And to ask also, why not um, associate a robot with another form of being, or with another resemblance, or another aesthetics that is not that of an animal, or of a, a mini version of an individual? Uh, so, the, the good question. So, well, w yeah, we've shown some biomimetic robots, and part of the reason that I'm interested in biomimetics is that I'm interested in using robots to do psychology. So I specifically want to build robots that copy the principles of, of life in some interesting way. But uh, I agree we should build robots and other morphologies. Of course, industrial robot arms don't look like arms in a conventional sense. Um, I'm, with Sebastian Conran, I'm building an intelligent bedside table that looks like a table. But it, it, it has some intelligence and it has some autonomy. And I think a lot of the robots that we will have in the future will be like that. Some of you may have robot vacuum cleaners. And of course, they don't look like anything at all. They sort of, uh, sort of look like frisbees that scut around on the floor and suck up dust. And I think they're great. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, I think 40% of people who have a robot vacuum cleaner have a pet name for their robot vacuum cleaner. And something like 30% admit to taking their robot vacuum cleaner on holiday. <laughs> so. Uh, it doesn't really matter if your robot looks animal-like or not. We will tend to attribute intentionality to these things because they behave in an autonomous, fairly lifelike way. And I think that's about us more than it is about the robots. Uh, going back to this question of, of what a person is, so I think we're far from creating a robot that would be like a person, would have all the attributes. It's interesting, though, that, that our idea of what a person is is or, uh, changing anyway, for example, in the news this week, I was reading about uh, the issues about non-human rights around chimpanzees and whether we should really keep uh, chim chimpanzees in captivity and, and, and use them for science. And people saying uh, that although chimpanzees aren't humans, they should have rights. And I think at, at some point, there will be a debate about at what point does an AI, uh, you have to think about AIs having rights. Now, People get confused with AI because, of course, they're not, AIs aren't individuals in the same way people and animals are. And AI doesn't necessarily have a boundary. So this robot has a physical body, but it could be part of a cloud, and its AI could be across the world in sort of some global way. Um, so it's going to change our idea, I think, of, of, of what an intelligent entity is. Uh, we're going to maybe rethink aspects of what a human is. Uh, perhaps of what uh, human rights are. And I think that's probably a good thing because we're gonna 
end up having a better understanding of ourselves as a consequence of that process. I'm sorry, I'm aware there are a couple of other questions, but in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap that up. So um, before we welcome Eleanor to the stage and do a quick stage turnaround, please join me in thanking you, Tony Prescott. Thank you so much for that presentation.